Hey everyone, in this video, I want to look at the Azure AD lifecycle workflows, a way to simplify the whole thinking about onboarding and offboarding users as they enter and exit your organization. Now, if we take a step back, if we think about it, we have our company, and our company, there are various life cycle phases that a user goes through. So I can think about, okay, we have our user, and on the one hand, I can think, okay, well, they're, they're coming into our organization. So hey, we've got our door to our company, and they're coming in. So in this case, we're thinking about we're joining. So we are a joiner to the organization. Now within the organization, there's different departments. Hey, maybe I start off in sales, um, I'm IT, whatever it is. But there's different departments, so maybe I move between different departments. Now remember, when I onboard, I probably get certain groups based on the department I'm joining, maybe certain Teams access, SharePoint, application, licensing, whatever that might be. And then when I move between departments, there's probably a different set of licenses and apps and groups and teams and SharePoint sites I should be a part of. Maybe I get a promotion. So I can think of these scenarios as mover. So within the company I've joined, I go through different phases that again will impact the state of me as a user. And obviously there's the concept of, well, I leave. I can think, okay, we've got the door, and essentially for that door, we're leaving our organization. Maybe I'm happy, maybe I'm sad, but I'm a lever. And if you think about leaving an organization, well, there's, there's other things that are gonna happen in that leaving. Hey, disable the account remove all these things, maybe send exit emails to managers or whatever that might be. And so if we really think about that for a second, let's put it in the perspective of the user account on um, my Azure Active Directory. So we have our Azure AD instance. And when we think about all of these various scenarios, we're really impacting the object of the user. So if we, again, keep that idea of join a mover lever, and if I think, okay, well, I have my user account. So I've got my user account over here, for example. If I'm joining the company, there might be different phases of joining the company. There's a pre on board, maybe, I have to obviously get my account created. So I can think, okay, I'm doing this so my account gets created. And then when I actually onboard, well maybe it then gets enabled. Maybe I get added to a certain group, group A. Maybe I get my mailbox set up. Maybe I get welcome instructions. So there's a whole set of things that happens when I onboard. This creation, this enablement, maybe I'm passwordless in my company. So what has to happen is a temporary access pass has to get created, which bootstraps the passwordless experience. And maybe that has to get emailed to my manager who then calls me up and gives me the instructions on how to use that temporary access pass and actually onboard to the passwordless experience in my company. If I think about when I'm leaving, well, if this was creating my account, well, maybe when I'm leaving, I have to delete all groups. I'm removed from all groups. I'm deleted from all teams. Maybe my account is disabled. And then maybe after a period of time, my account is then actually deleted. So there's a whole set of time elements to that. And of course, while I'm in the company, if I think about those mover scenarios, well maybe, hey, I, I changed role, and so I need to get removed from, for example, group A, but I'm added to group B. And the idea of the groups is really powerful. There's obviously other things I could add licenses, add apps. 
But one of the things that's really good if we can is to actually use the groups. I can use groups to assign licenses. I can use groups to assign applications. I can use groups to obviously configure things like access. And when I think of groups, there's two key types available to me. They're static, where I add the user into the group. I remove the user from the group. And then there's dynamic. And dynamic enables me to have rules that govern who is in that group. Hey, if you're in this department A, you're a member of group A. If you're in department B, then you're in group B. And what I'm stressing that is this is not part of lifecycle workflows at all, but this dynamic ability is really powerful to use this. So rather than having those kind of static groups, think about having dynamic groups based on some attribute of the user that I can really use to drive things like group memberships and all of those other things. So we really want to use those groups if we can. But I can think, if I think of that user lifecycle, there's a ton of different things that happens when I join, when I move, when I leave. And ideally, I want some kind of identity governance solution driving that. I don't want to manually do all those actions. It would be great if something could trigger those actions, both from a nice, consistent onboarding experience and offboarding, but also just making sure we are adhering to the governance requirements of our organization, avoiding permissions getting left around. Because very, very commonly, if I go and change departments, yeah, I'll get the new groups added, but I don't get the old ones removed. So over time, if I stay in a company, I get this ever escalating set of permissions. We really want to avoid those excess permissions, those excess accesses being left behind. Now, as if I think of Azure Active Directory, I mean, there are a, a ton of features that can really help drive governance. There are features like entitlement management. Entitlement management lets me create access packages that can consist of groups and teams and applications and SharePoint teams that users can be assigned. It can be time bombed. I can make it available so users can go and request but it helps bring these things into focus in these nice packages based on maybe roles, based on some time span. We have things like access reviews. Again, all focused around avoiding having app assignments, group memberships, um, Azure AD roles, access packages that are just left around. So either a manager or some delegated party or even self-review because they do I still need whichever target, be it group or role or app, I still require. Privilege identity management. Let me elevate up when I need it, not just sitting there kind of stagnant. And then there's that idea of life cycle management specifically. And I can think of two key parts to that life cycle management. There's an idea really around this human resources and app provisioning. For applications, hey, I want to be able to integrate with these other apps. I don't want to have to manually create users on some other cloud system or anything else. We can use Skim. I can integrate in and automatically leverage my user identities to use on the other systems. If it's from that HR scenario, well, hey, I have some HR application, some HR system that is tying in to our Azure Active Directory. It could be Workday, it could be success factors, but it's going and provisioning and creating those accounts. Now, if I'm using AD, it's actually sort of going through a provisioning service in Azure AD, creating it in AD and then replicating it back up. But to all intents and purposes, hey, it's provisioning and setting attributes in my Azure Active Directory. And then of course, the big focus here is lifecycle workflows. The entire purpose of what we're going to focus on. 
So I can really think about this complete scenario driving workflows all the way through. And that's obviously what we're gonna focus on as part of this talk. Now, when we do think about lifecycle workflows, like most of these enterprise type governance features, my Azure AD needs to be P2. Now today, that does not mean every user requires an Azure AD P2 license. I just need at least one, which makes my Azure AD a P2 level. So if you was to go and look, now I'm gonna use the Entra portal. So I am in entra.microsoft.com, but you could absolutely just use the regular Azure AD portal and go to various um, Azure portal in the Azure AD areas. But what I see in my overview page is I see the level of my Azure AD, which is based on my highest license. So I need it to be Azure AD Premium P2, which again, I just need a single user to have an Azure AD Premium P2 license. And then today, this could change in the future, but I can use lifecycle workflows for any of my users. Now, one of the things that we're gonna focus on for lifecycle workflows today is the scenarios it's going to cover. Now, lifecycle workflows are really geared today around joiner and lever. Those were the biggest areas that customers were saying, hey, we have pain points around this. So that onboarding, that offboarding via predefined templates, I can configure the tasks that it's gonna do, but those are the scenarios that it's focused on right now. You cannot create your own templates. So if I've jumped back over for a second, and then we're gonna go into a lot more detail about this, but if I go to my identity governance area, I see lifecycle workflows. And as I go and look inside lifecycle workflows, I have the various workflows available. And if I do create, I can see the six scenarios. So onboarding pre-hire, i.e. in advance of them starting, onboarding new hire, so actually when they're onboarded, and then offboarding scenarios. Real-time employee termination, doesn't say terrible, you're out straight away. Pre-offboarding, so someone's leaving, given advance notice, maybe there's some notifications you give them in advance to start, hey, please do this, please prepare your laptop, whatever. Actual when they leave, and then post, maybe a couple of weeks after, we actually go and delete the account and do some other things. And if I think about all the different tasks that are available to me, I can select which ones I want. So if I was to look at Joiner, for example, we can see all the different tasks that are available. Now, some of them I could use Joiner or Lever. Maybe if they leave, they're added to some kind of, hey, these are all the people that used to work here. You can stay in contact with each other. It was kind of a, a Lumini type things. Some of them are just Joiner. Hey, generate that temporary access pass and send an email to their manager. Send a welcome email. And likewise, there are certain tasks that would be unique just to offboarding. So if I was to go and look at a offboarding scenario and look at the tasks, we'll see some tasks that are only for lever. Hey, delete the account, remove users from all groups, from all teams and all licenses, send offboarding emails to the user's manager on the last day of work, before the last day of work, after the last day of work. So we get different tasks, but I can select which ones of those tasks based on these various workflows. So this is the key point of lifecycle workflows. Today, it's a set of predefined templates, six of them, two around onboarding, four for the offboarding scenarios. It's not focusing on that mover scenario today. Now it's all rule-based triggering. It's gonna look at particular attributes of the user, start date, end date in particular, and then a certain number of days, and that's gonna trigger these things to actually run. Now, if you are thinking of the mover scenarios today, there are still things to help. Obviously things like entitlement management and those access packages can help as I move between different departments. But dynamic groups, I will keep coming back to this. And even when we talk about lifecycle workflows, I like dynamic groups because I can have those rules that say, hey, if I go and change department, 
my group membership is based on department. So as I move from department A to department B, well, that rule would automatically remove me when my department attribute changes to department B. Hey, I'll be removed from group A and any um, permissions and licenses and apps that were associated with group A and will automatically then give me licenses, access, apps for group B. So dynamic groups can be super powerful to help with that. I should also stress, when I talk about lifecycle workflows, it's not doing any magic. I could do exactly the same thing as myself through APIs and scripts or manually. The point of the lifecycle workflows is it really simplifies it. It makes it very simpli simplified for me. It helps automate it. So what are the requirements for this to actually kick in and do its various tasks? So if I think about well, how this is gonna work, something has to go and create the account because again, it, it's trigger based. So if I think about the focus of everything we're gonna do, it is gonna have to have some trigger. So there's, throughout all of the different types, there has to be a trigger. And except for if I do it on demand, like the immediate off-boarding a termination scenario, that trigger's gonna really be based on, hey, a hire date and a termination date. But saying else has to create the account. Now that account could be created by that HR app, as we talked about. So we can go and integrate in with the provisioning engine of Azure AD, which itself can then go and talk to AD. It may even be that account just gets created via Active Directory. I have Active Directory, Domain Services, with Azure AD Connect or Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync that creates the accounts. And that's maybe all I need to have. But something else is creating it, and then the workflow will trigger based on attributes of the user. Now, when I think about the attributes of the user, there's really just two key attributes it cares about. And if we think about, we're focusing on onboarding and offboarding, well, those two attributes we care about is employee hire date, they, they join the company and start working. And then employee, you're gonna guess it, leave date and time. A bit more specific in terms of the attribute name. Those are the key attributes we must have. So these can be set as part of the HR app. Now obviously there won't be an employee leave date time when someone joins the company, that, that will be blank but I will populate the employee hire date to drive the onboarding scenarios, the pre-onboard, the actual onboarding. And then when they are leaving, well then I would populate the employee leave date time either via the HR app, or I can synchronize custom attributes from AD with Azure AD Connect, and then it can do those trigger-based runnings of the offload type scenarios. Um, now the employee hire date, I can actually set directly in the portal. So if I jump over for a second, if I go and look at my users, and I'll look at Dick Grayson, and we look at, we'll actually edit, and we look at the job information, notice employee hire date is right here. So I can edit that directly in the Azure AD portal, if it's a cloud user. Now, if this user is synchronized from Active Directory, I can't set this directly in Azure AD because AD is the source of truth. In that scenario, what I can absolutely do is if AD is the source of truth, I could modify my Azure AD Connect or Cloud Sync, and I would use an extension attribute or custom attribute to populate it. So in their documentation, they talk about, hey, look, use extension attribute one, and that's what you're gonna to use to target employee hire dates. So in your on-prem AD, I would put the start date in extension attribute one, and then that will replicate via Azure AD Connect into employee hire date. Now obviously I could do exactly the same thing for the end date. Now I can't see the employee end date, that is a more sensitive attribute, and it talks about in the documentation, permissions required to see it. 
It gives me some commands I could use to actually go and set it. But again, my HR systems, I could have my own, a second custom attribute in AD to replicate. There's different ways to actually populate it. But realize I have to have those. That is what's gonna trigger those onboarding and those offboarding type scenarios. Now, another important attribute you're gonna want is manager. Because a number of the scenarios are about emailing the manager of the user. So I want that manager actually populated. So, well, we can actually do this. So this is, this is the goal of what we really want to do here. So let's take a look at this. The easiest way to learn is to always go and see these things. So if we jump back over to the portal, let's close all these down. And as we go and look at identity governance and lifecycle workflows, we have this overview page that straight away gives us an idea of some of the things. So we can see what our workflow schedule is, three hours. So we know it's running on a schedule. So it's gonna check for those triggers every three hours. I know I have one that is actually schedule based. I have one that has the schedule disabled and I don't have any deleted at this time. And then I can actually go and look at my workflows as we kind of saw, I have two. So I have my onboard pre-hire, which will be schedule based. We can see that end column over here. Then I have that schedule based. And then I have my real time termination. Obviously I don't want that on a schedule. If I'm terminating someone, I just want that to happen right now. So if that's not on a schedule, I'm gonna basically do an on demand execution of that. But I also have this ability to have custom extensions. So I showed you that there were many tasks built into it and I can select which ones I want. But maybe I need to integrate with some system that isn't one of those maybe more standard tasks. So the other thing I can leverage is I can think about, well, Azure has Logic Apps. So as part of my workflows, any of my workflows, I can create an Azure Logic App. So I have my Logic App that itself can do anything. It can go and call any RESTful API, do anything I want. And I configure this, actually I should use a different color here. Let's be consistent. This is now part of workflows. So I can configure this as a custom extension. So I define it as a custom extension within lifecycle workflows and it itself then just calls the logic app. And obviously I can call this from any of the scenarios, be it the offboarding or the onboarding can then go and call a custom extension I've defined, which itself that logic app can then go and call really anything any other action I want to do, I could write a logic app to do it and it will go and do all the hard work for me. Now I've got one defined here. I don't configure anything about what properties I want to send it. It does all that for me and it would even create the skeleton logic app for me. So if I did add a custom extension, I give it a name, a description, does it run and continue, I run it asynchronously. So it wants it to go and kick off a task, but it can then carry on and do the rest of the workflow while it's running or launch and wait. I need to do it synchronously. I need to wait for it to finish before I continue. And then the details is just, well, what's the logic app? And it will even go ahead and create it for me if I want. And what it's gonna do, if it creates it for me, if we go and look in the logic app designer, it just sets it up to receive a HTTP request and then I can go and see what it actually sends it. So it's gonna send it a set schema, the display name of the subject, email of the subject, ID of the subject, manager information, including the email and ID, the user principal name of the subject, I the user, and then display name, the ID. So I'm gonna get a set of attributes to the Logic App I could then use and decide, well, what do I want to do through the rest of the execution of this logic app? 
Maybe I use those values to then go and call various other things. So that's a, a really useful capability. So hey, the built-in tasks don't do what I want. I can go and create a logic app and add it as a custom extension. Now outside of that, then we have again the workflows. And there are six templates today. I would expect this to grow over time. I think that mover scenario will probably show up over time as well. They're gonna keep building on this. But today we have these six scenarios. And if I was to just select, for example, pre-hire, obviously I can give it a more specific name, a description. This is the key point. So for the hiring scenarios, it's always gonna be before the employee hire date but I can configure the number of days. If I instead select the actual onboarding, well this time it's on the actual employee hire date. There's nothing to configure because this is, this is actually their start date. If I was to select real time, so let's select that, this is actually I wanna terminate someone, it can't be scheduled, it's only on demand. And I wanna stress even the scheduled ones, I can run on demand as well. If I go and look at the pre-offloading, you're gonna guess what this is. The big difference here now is the attribute. It's the employee leave date time instead of the employee, um, the start date, so the hire date, so that's what's different. It's always before and it's a number of days that I can configure. If I was to go and look, and you're gonna guess what all the rest of them are. Is the actual offboarding, well, it's on the actual day of the leave date time. And if we were to select the post, well, guess what? It's gonna be a certain number of days after. So that's what the templates do. And I pick the template based on, is this is pre, is this on the date, or is this post in terms of the offboarding? And then I can configure a scope. So this would let me, for example, rather than this just apply to all users, maybe I've got an onboarding scenario that's specific to the marketing department. In this case, hey, I've got department of the user equals marketing. But there are other attributes that I could use as well. Now, the reason you might want these scopes is if I think about that onboarding scenario, well, maybe what I'm actually adding them to is the marketing group. To me, I would rather not have those very departmental specific groups as a separate workflow. I'm gonna have a lot of workflows. I would rather try and keep the workflows more generic. And then for membership of groups, try and use the dynamic rules if you can. to so create a dynamic, so it's completely separate from lifecycle workflows, not involved in that at all. Lifecycle workflows is doing the other, more common set of tasks required for the onboarding and offboarding but to add and remove from groups, if you can, I would use dynamic rules to trigger off of, hey, the department is this, add them to a group. And then when they leave, when that department is nullified, they get removed from that group. But certainly, I could use those scopes to create very specific multiple workflows based on department A, department B, department C, department D. But if you find there's a lot of commonality between them, there's a fair amount of waste there and a lot of overhead you're gonna be adding to yourself. So really think about, hey, lifecycle workflows are fantastic, but it's one tool in your belt. I can absolutely combine those with things like dynamic groups and their rules to complete the overall um, set of those functionalities. And so the key point is, hey, I've got this trigger-based stuff. And what I'm gonna do just super quickly, I wanna give myself a little bit more space. So if these are all trigger-based, let's move this down a bit. So these are all trigger-based scenarios. I'm gonna move this down as well. One of the things I like about this board, so I'm going sort of over here. So what are those scenarios again? So remember what we can do is if I think about, hey, joiner scenario. So for the joiner, in terms of time, well, we have the pre. And that's n number of days before employee hire date. Then I can have the actual onboard. board. 
which is gonna be the actual employee hire date. Then I can think once again, if for the lever scenario, we have pre, n number of days before the employee leave date time, we have off board, the actual date, and then we even have post. So all of these, these are all based off of a schedule. And by default, that schedule is every three hours, but I can configure it between one and 24 hours. So how often do I need that to run? And that's part of the properties. So if we was to jump over for a second, if I just go and look at my overall overview here and look at my workflow schedule, and we can see that every three hours. Now, I can also run them on demand. So even a regular workflow. So if we quickly just looked at, hey, creating a workflow. Let's say it's this onboarding. We have this trigger and scope based. Again, it's on the day of the employee hire date that's been populated by something. I could, if I wanted to, configure a certain scope so we can add multiple expressions if we wanted to, or just don't have anything in there. I can add and remove tasks. So these are all the tasks that are available to me, including that add a custom task extension, which itself could then call my particular logic app that I added as a custom extension. So that's always available to me. But you'll actually notice, if I just remove that one, we have two states. So a tick means it has everything it needs. So enable the user account, well, it just enables the user ID. Send a welcome email, which is gonna send an email to the user. But add a user to a group, well, which group? So I'd have to go and add the particular groups. It's only static groups. So which static groups I wanna add this user to. So right now, that's not really usable. And then I would populate however I wanted to and then go and create it. Now, I already did an onboard pre-hire. And the only tasks I have here is to generate that temporary access pass and send an email. That's gonna send an email to the attribute manager of the user. And then I can configure the details of well, how long does that temporary access pass last. So it's gonna email the manager. The manager would have, in this case, eight hours to notify the user so they can use it to bootstrap their passwordless setup. But this is based on a schedule. So I've enabled the schedule. But even though it has the schedule, I can still run it on demand. And that's really useful for troubleshooting and for it for just experimenting as I'm creating these things. So I could go and add a particular user. So I could add, for example, uh, Dick Grayson, who has that employee hire date populated and just run the workflow. So that will then go and run it. And then Bruce, his manager, sorry, Dick's manager, Bruce Wayne, I ran it earlier on this morning at 419. But what I should see is another email should pop up because I'm executing it again which would be like, hey, you have a new team member joining based on that task. Here is their temporary access pass that you can go and give to them. And we get really nice, oh, so there we go, as I'm talking, so 9.22, Dick is joining the team soon, um, help them on board. Here is the temporary access pass that they're gonna need. Please share it with Dick so they can go and sign in on their first day. So it gives them all the information so they can then go and help that user on board to the system. Now, when I'm looking at this workflow, the nice thing is that on-demand bypasses any filters. I can just specify what I want to happen again. That's what I'd have to use for that real-time termination. But what I can also now see is for that onboard pre-hire, I can see the history. If I refresh, I can see all my executions of it, and I can see their success or failure. So I could go and click on, okay, so the users, 
I can see everything related to each user. I could see the individual runs, and we can see, hey, one of them is still in process, the one that's running right now. I can also see the different tasks, and I can see some failed, some completed, and some are in progress. And I can dive in and get all of the details. So the failure, okay, why did this first one fail? Okay, well, it failed on the disk, Dick Grayson, it failed the task. Oh, I hadn't populated employee hire date. So it shows even on demand, I still have to have the right attribute. And then I tried it again, I set a date, but I set the date incorrectly, and it's, well, the attribute is in the past. It has to be in the future to do a pre-onboarding task. And then I finally got it right. As you can see kind of how I learn. And this time it completed. And it completed. So it just, hey, there was no problem. And this latest one is still going through checking any other checks, but then that will, that will finish pretty soon as well. So I get this really nice history for each of my workflows so I can see what's happening. If there's different versions, so if I was to look at my real time, I have different versions. And I can go and look at the tasks. Okay, for that's that version. Okay, I, I added a task for this. So I can go and see the details of exactly what's happened. So I get versioning. I can see the complete history of everything that's happening on a per workflow level. Now, one important thing to understand about those multiple tasks. So a workflow can have many tasks as part of it. If a task fails, so let's say I'm doing the third task. If the third task failed, it will not carry on with the remaining tasks, but it doesn't roll back the previous ones. If you think about some types of tasks, how would it easily roll back? Some things really can't be rolled back. If I was sending an email, maybe I can recall messages, but there's mixed success. If I was calling a Logic App, how do I know how to uncall a Logic App? There's no reverse of that. So it doesn't roll back. So if I have multiple tasks as part of any kind of workflow here, if it fails, that task failed, any subsequent task will fail, but any preceding ones, they still happened. So I'd wanna go and look and validate exactly what happened, what maybe cleanup I need to do, because it can't just roll back. This is not an atomic workflow. It can't roll back what's already been successfully completed. So just bear that in mind when I think about, hey, if I have a failure, I really need to go back and look so I can clean up before I maybe go and do anything else around that. But if we carry on looking at kind of what's available to us, so this is great on a per workflow level, but also I can just have audit logs. I get this nice overall audit log of everything that it's done, everything that's happening. I have filters, so I could target sort of all who I'm actually trying to look at. I have different types of activities. Hey, okay, enable task, enable workflow, update tasks. I can really dive in and see whatever I want to have, task management, workflows. So there's a real lot of great information available to me. If I delete a workflow, it goes to a soft delete. I can restore it for up to 30 days. And this is in preview right now. But it's a, to be honest, even where it is right now, it gives a lot of nice functionality for those onboarding, for those offboarding scenarios. And I could do this already. I could write my own stuff. But by having these predefined templates with these very common tasks, it makes it super simple to go and onboard to these. And I can really think for a lot of times, the lifecycle workflows pick up where maybe my HR system stops. So I have my HR app that maybe goes and provisions the user, it set maybe the department, and then my lifecycle workflows can trigger through that pre-communications, that actual onboarding, the offboarding, whatever it needs to do. Don't forget about those dynamic groups. They're so powerful. It would avoid me having to have lots and lots of scoped individual workflows for onboarding, offboarding, to instead maybe let me have a lot fewer number that were more generic and let the dynamic groups based on department attribute, for example, or level, or whatever, use the groups to give licenses and all those other access and, and what those things are. 
uh, behind the scenes is a custom engine. It's not Logic Apps. I was thinking it was. It's not. It's its own custom engine, but of course it can call Logic Apps if you wanted it to. The docks are really good. It's very intuitive. Be careful. Any automation is fantastic. It can be used for fantastic good, but it can also be used um, for a lot of evil, or at least it has the scope to do a lot of damage. If I'm gonna start experimenting, particularly with off-boarding things, make sure you've got this right. Now the good news is the off-boarding is triggered off of that termination date, which shouldn't be populated for most users. So that should be a good thing. But make sure you're scoping correctly. Make sure you maybe use that on demand and have the schedule turned off where you're learning. Maybe the onboarding, it's sending emails. I don't wanna bombard my entire company with a welcome email. And again, that shouldn't happen because that a lot of those should be maybe in the future for some of that stuff or on the day. But just be aware, any automation, scope your tests. Use the on-demand testing to make sure you, you don't cause some impact or just noise that you really just don't want to do. But again, docs are great. Make, use that on-demand to learn and play around with it. This is, I think, the V1. I will think it's gonna grow beyond that joiner lever, and I think they will probably start looking at mover in the future. But mover is very difficult. Movers are a lot more tricky about, okay, well, what, what am I removing from and adding to? It's generally a more dynamic thing. And there are some functions around that already. But I hope that helped explain what this is, lifecycle workflows. Hey, picks up from where your HR or AD replication and performs those very, very common tasks for that onboarding, that offboarding communications you may want to do. I hope that was useful. Until the next video, take care.